My bags were packed for me when I had arrived home from school. I had just started my freshman year, only turning 14 at the time. All I got from my parents that afternoon was, get in the car. In that moment, I started to list in my head everything bad I had previously done. It was like a flashback filled with underage partying, alcohol, and drugs. Let's not forget the illegal stunts that I pulled, like vandalism and trespassing. In the car, I didn't dare ask what was happening or where we were going. Other had an idea when I heard a bizarre phone call the night before. The call consisted of a one-sided conversation between my dad and someone else. At that moment, my best guess would have been the pastor from the church. I heard my father say, we just can't take it anymore. We don't know what to do with her. She's a problem. Those last three little words have been forever engraved in my mind. She's a problem. A kid just does not forget something like that. Like when I was eight, my dad would tell people I was adopted and that he picked me up from the side of the road. I remember crying about that every time until my mom finally heard him say it and yelled at him. So I didn't forget. Year one. In the car, my dad had a blank poker face and my mom was silently crying in the passenger seat. We drove to some place in the middle of a desert with huge hills surrounding it. Little did I know I would spend the next four years here. All I saw was a single road. There in the front was a sign which read Christian Baptist Church. I realized we were in Mexico. Even worse, we were in an institution, a place where orphans lived and parents like mine would send the kids to. A big place with big gray house in the middle of several other gray houses. There was only one dark blue house in the very back corner and there was no civilization. The roads were far away and there was no chance of escape. Upon our arrival, we were taken in to see the head of the facility. Mr. and Mrs. Walker were sitting inside with blank, comforting faces, but they weren't fooling me. Mr. Walker was very tall, browed, intimidating gringo with pe piercing green eyes that made me want to crawl into a hole and die. Mrs. Walker, on the other hand, was tiny, meek, and submissive. She wouldn't speak in front of a man unless she was told to. Later, I came to know that when her husband wasn't around, she could be very intimidating. Her mere presence made me squirm. In the office, they sat me down and began to tell me what, that I was to live there now because my parents could no longer be with me and that I was a bad person. What they couldn't see is that me being bad was not entirely my fault. Sure, I couldn't point fingers, but I was a 14-year-old girl who had for years wanted her parents' approval and attention. All I would ever get was, I'm tired, we'll talk later. But tomorrow never came. It would be the same routine all over again. When good deeds didn't get me their attention, in my mind, bad deeds would. It did, for a while. Apart from being curious and artsy, my inability to show guilt or remorse for my past actions brought them to believe I was possessed by the devil. Hell, they may even thought I was saint's mistress, for all I know. They said I was incapable of feeling any type of emotions, but they were wrong. I felt abandoned and betrayed by the people I loved the most. My parents signed the paperwork, giving the institution all the rights to me. It was like I had been sold. They left me standing in front of the house, alone, with a single tear dripping down my face. I want to believe they watched me disappear in the rearview mirror. I was escorted into what would be my dorm. As I walked up the stairs of the gloomy gray building, I saw some kids as I was passing the child's ward. There was Ruby, the incarnation of Chucky. Physically, she was only missing the scars, but mentally, she was an evil, demonic little five-year-old. There was Esme, the 10-year-old who had been raped and was now a grown nymphomaniac, molesting other little girls. There were girls with dementia and all sorts of mental health issues. When I got to my dorm, there were five bank butts and a small bathroom inside. After meeting these girls, I came to realize we all had two things in common. We all had been abandoned, and we were all categorized as mental. The whole place had been built on top of an old cemetery, and everybody talked about how it was haunted. The first night, I could hear the squeaky old swing sets moving. It could have been the wind, but later I thought it was Miguel, the little boy who had visited the church at our institution two times, and on the third time, we went to pick him up. The neighbors told us the kid we were looking for had died a few years back. I couldn't sleep that night. The footsteps in the attic, the little girl with the white dress that would stand by your bed at night. I still feel the chills of the night I woke up and there she was. I never believed in ghosts until that moment. 
the parents of the home I stayed in, Sister Carmen, an intimidating and demanding, and her husband Jose, a dweep with no backbone. This is the moment they began to tell me the do's and don'ts of the house. All my clothes got thrown away along with my personal belongings. I was to dress in the gloomy clothes they gave me, contact with the opposite sex, thinking of the opposite sex, mundane music, ambitions, dreams, everything from the outside world was a sin. Don't get me started on homosexuality. You might as well be saying himself. Now I wonder how they would have reacted if they found out I was bisexual. They most probably would have stoned me and my ex-girlfriend Caroline at the quarter. My thoughts were no longer my own. I was to do, say, and think how they told me to. I could no longer have a dream of being what I wanted. I had to stay in the path of the Lord, and more importantly, I was to stay a virgin. Funny, when they figured out what no longer was, they baptized me in melody so Christ could cleanse away my sin. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Looking back on my baptism, I now see how ridiculous the whole idea was. I don't think they realized in that moment some holy water from the pipe wasn't going to grow my hymen back. That was the future they were planning for me, but I refused to be any of that. The moment after my parents left me was the last night I ever cried myself to sleep. I was not going to break. I was going to be strong because I knew that one day I'd be out and finally free. The first couple of weeks I was there, I planned my escape, but I soon came to realize there was no way out, just like I had predicted upon my arrival. Year two. I was lucky if I saw my parents a couple times every month. Keeping me in the institution was a problem for them because they had to pay monthly for my stay and schooling. That was dedication. I would wonder every time if I was that bad of a person that my parents would pay for me to be away from them. I actually began to believe that was all it was, the problem. I wanted to end my life at 15. I wanted to be free from all the pain and rejection, rejection. but in the end, I just didn't go through with it. Little by little, I started to learn to shut down my emotions and refuse to feel the pain, especially the physical one. And by physical, I mean that one time they were spanking this girl named Melissa, who's like a five-year-old stuck in a 13-year-old's body. They hit her so bad with a huge, heavy wooden spoon that they broke it on her. Instinctively, I stepped in the middle. My body absorbed the blow, but there was nothing on my face that showed I had been struck. I locked everything I had felt in the box and buried it deep inside. After a year, I was made to believe I liked the way I lived, and I was happy, they told me. All I learned was to smile through my pain. I learned that I hate being sent to solitary. The darkness and loneliness makes you feel like you're going mad. I remember the first time I was punished for saying a bad word that had slipped my tongue. They had left me in the small shower cubicle during the day while everyone was doing chores. I was totally fine by it, a bit boring, but better than cleaning the kitchen. At night is when the real problem began. When it was dark is when the panic started to set in. I felt like the wolves were moving and squeezing me. There was sweat dripping down my body. All senses were hind in that moment. The steps in the attic started again and I could hear everything. I feared if I looked up, something would be down looking at me or something was going to rip the sharon corn and drag me away. I didn't believe in monsters before that. But then all the monsters became real. They were no longer in my head. They had escaped and were watching me squirm and sweat. I curled myself in the fetal position on that tile, wet tile floor. I started to see dark spots in my vision. And as soon as the clock hit 11 and they let me out, I couldn't run any faster to my bed and cover myself under the blanket, my only protector. Year three, emptiness. Year four, on September 9, 2013, I woke up really early. The chilly morning air whistled in through the cracked window, but for once, instead of gray, I saw colors. A big rainbow flag being waved like a freedom flag, to be exact. Today was my birthday. I was officially 18. I was now my own person. Nobody owned me anymore. I could finally say goodbye to that house of terrors. I spent so long trying to be the person they wanted me to be that I had no idea who I was. The things other teens had figured out about themselves years before, I was only starting to understand. My taste in music, for example. I started to figure out so many things about myself that it blew my mind away. I learned that I want to be really happy, not fate, not, not like a robot, but only I can bring myself that happiness. I want to be able to be free to draw anything that comes to my mind without fearing someone is going to come up to me and snatch it and be sent to solitary. 
The pain, torture, and suffering was done. The last week had been really bad since they knew I was going to leave soon. More darkness, loneliness, and mistreatment. More chores and punishment, but for once that could not bring me down. I no longer felt the physical pain. I had a huge smile on my face as I got down from my bank bed and packed my few belongings and marched down the stairs. As I passed the staff and heads of the facility, I bit back the urge to give them the finger. That would have been very mature of me. I finally said my goodbyes to some of the patients and the orphans I actually got along with. After all, we had that one thing in common. We were all insane. Give it up for Noemi Flores.